Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a program of the Competitive Enterprise Institute focused on how we can repeal for resilience. I'm joined today by the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Ajit Pai. Chairman Pai hails from Kansas. He was educated at Harvard and the University of Chicago, and he's held positions in all three branches of the federal government. He finds himself at the FCC now for eight years and in the role of chairman since 2017. We'll be recording the event today for posterity, or as I like to think of it, for YouTube. If you're watching <laughs> live, I'd like, to, I'd like to have you be part of our conversation. So throughout the next hour, I'll monitor questions from our audience that come in online. I'll share as many as I can with the chairman, and you can either email your question to events at cei.org, or if you look to the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button should allow you to send them directly into the queue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to say thank you for being with CEI once again. As you know, I always look forward to a conversation about the intersection of communications and regulation. And if it's all right with you, we'll just dive right in. I've got a whole slew of questions for you, and we'll either go until we time out or you cry uncle. Is that all right? <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks for having me on, Ken. Wonderful. All right. Well, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, perhaps that's because the remit of the FCC is so broad and uh, we might encourage the Congress to do something about that. <laughs> but before we get to telehealth initiatives or internet access issues, the digital divide, I want to start with the basics. Uh, your work and the work of the Commission, how has it been affected by the lockdowns? A great question. And uh, first, though, Kent, I want to thank you and CEI for all of the support uh, that you have given us over the last several years. Uh, your vision of a more market-based uh, regulatory framework is one that we share, and your support for a bunch of different FCC initiatives from uh, C-band to uh, closing the digital divide in a market-based way has been really helpful. So thank you for that. And as I said, for providing this forum for discussion. Um, our work has been changed fundamentally in, over the last six months. Uh, first, physically, we've been working from home for almost six months now in early March, uh, March 12th, we uh, started that. But also, just in terms of the workload, in addition to our typical bread and butter work, uh, we've also done a lot with respect to the pandemic. And so shifting all the FCC's 1,400 plus employees to the home environment and adding on to that a variety of pandemic related causes has been a challenge, but I'm proud to say that they've really stepped up to the plate. Our IT team work has done a great job keeping us connected in this virtual environment. And we produced results that I think are the envy of uh, many other agencies and speak well for the American people's trust in us, I think. Can you, can you tell me, um, you know, we've, we have found uh, the regulatory docket itself, right? You prepare your arguments in your, your brief, your uh, comments, you send them in, but the work of collaborating with the bureau chiefs and your fellow commissioners, has that changed? We have a legal model for independent agencies that has all of these protections with sun, sunrise, sunset um, provisions. There's provisions about how many of you can meet and how often you meet outside of a formal meeting that is uh, available to the public. Um, do we need to rethink the entire apparatus of how agencies operate if we're moving to a more distributed coronavirus era? That's a good question. So uh, from our perspective, at least, the legal uh, framework that governs our operations is flexible enough to accommodate this environment when mixed with the technology that's now available that, that frankly wasn't available, let's say 10, 20 years ago. So for example, at the FCC's monthly meetings where all five commissioners get together and vote on items that are teed up by the chairman, uh, we have shifted to a Microsoft Teams environment where I essentially are, am the MC, if you will, of the festivities, and then each commissioner speaks. The bureau and office chiefs get admission uh, to that uh, Teams platform as need be. And it's actually worked extremely well. Uh, everybody get, has a chance to see everybody else gets to speak their mind in the same way as they would in the physical environment. Um, in terms of the behind the scenes work with the Bureau and Office Chiefs, I'll say it's been fantastic. And my team and I have done a lot of outreach to the various bureaus and offices. I personally have held a number of different phone calls with entire bureaus or with subsets of bureaus and uh, your teams that do a good job on a particular topic, for example. I convene a number of different phone calls just to say thanks or to see what's on their mind. I've held a number of town halls 
just to see how folks are doing. And while it's not an, it's an imperfect substitute at best, of course, for seeing people physically in the headquarters, nonetheless, I'm trying to use this uh, technology and telecommunications uh, in order to keep us a little more, to preserve that sense that we're all on the, all on the same page and we're all part of a larger enterprise. So it's been a challenge, but technology has really helped us. Okay. Now, you're often described as a, a deregulatory regulator. Uh, I think your term as chairman, it might be more accurate, technical, but more accurate to say that the FCC is regulating less intensively. Uh, but in many cases, it's very, very difficult to actually eliminate a regulation. So regulatory burden can go down, but the regulations remain, and they remain available to future iterations of the FCC. Uh, how have we seen the markets respond to your leadership, this less intensive, less invasive regulatory approach? whether uh, mm. investment or the way they interact with you, are they more or less competitive? Are they uh, chummy now? Because they think you're, you're their friend. What, 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 have, what do we see with the market and the private actors? I think the results speak for themselves that our belief in markets over mandates has proven to be one that is better for consumers at the end of the day. Uh, so for example, on the, in terms of fiber deployment, we set a record in 2018 for fiber deployment to homes and businesses in the United States, a record that was broken in 2019. And that followed two consecutive declines in 2015 and 2016 in infrastructure investment, the first ever declines we saw uh, outside of a recession. And so just in terms of that, I would argue that we've seen a market change because we are focused on preserving a competitive environment, giving companies a strong incentive to raise capital, to hire work crews, and ultimately build next generation networks. And uh, where there's a market failure, we do take targeted action. For example, when it comes to public safety, or recently I targeted the inmate calling services market as one that is fundamentally broken in some significant ways. And there we use our legal authority to take action uh, to preserve consumer welfare. But generally speaking, I think we've had a very carefully calibrated regulatory framework that, as you said, is not focused on a slogan like deregulation or getting rid of all regulations. It's focused on how do we preserve to the maximum extent possible the market-based framework, and if that's not possible, how do we take carefully circumscribed action that's tailored to the competitive harm and is likely to produce benefits to the American consumer. And I think that's ultimately where the consumer interest lies, notwithstanding some of the political rhetoric you might hear about this or that issue. I'm going to come back to the consumer interest in a, in a little bit, but let's jump straight from that fiber deployment, these record deployments of infrastructure, uh, which is one path. It's a very common path for broadband and 5G access, uh, very high speed access, I should say, um, 5G being wireless. How does that affect our resilience in the last six months with telehealth? I mean, we suddenly have people uh, being told to stay away from their medical providers so that they could deal with an onrush of coronavirus cases. Um, what, what is the recent evidence of how it really affects the way people live? That's a fantastic question. And recently I pointed to the South that the keys to broadband connectivity during the pandemic uh, were, were essentially investments that were made before anyone had even heard of COVID-19. The fact that we have seen broadband and internet uh, traffic, broadband internet traffic go and voice traffic as well, go up significantly over the last six months. But even then, fixed broadband speeds have gone up 10% over that time, which is amazing when you think about it. Even with the increase in traffic, there's been an increase in speeds. I would argue that because we put in place uh, the block roadblocks, I mean, we got rid of some of the roadblocks for infrastructure investment over the last several years. Companies made investments so that when something like a pandemic hit, they were able to create an art network architecture that could sustain that peak. And you contrast that with Europe, for example, which has much more utility style regulation as a consequence of that has a fraction of the infrastructure investment we've got. They had to proactively go to companies like YouTube and Netflix and ask them to throttle content to consumers because they weren't convinced that the networks could handle the load. So they have the worst of both worlds, the utility style regulation that disincentivizes infrastructure investment all the time, as well as the inability to deliver high bandwidth traffic to consumers during something like a pandemic. So I think our market-based framework is the one that has stood the test of time, and especially now when so many consumers are under distress. Let me see if I can just ask you to 
clarify, I want to make sure that everybody understands part of what you just said, uh, because as I hear you tell that story, the compare and contrast, the comparative uh, regulatory structures and the economic effects, the concern in 2015 was that private actors, providers of networks, private companies would prevent information flowing to select consumers. There would be throttling. The people would be shut off from what they wanted. And that was the concern that drove a very heavy handed regulatory approach. And what I believe you're telling me is that the regulators who took that approach and stuck with it are now the ones calling up providers and saying, please throttle, please stop yeah. information from flowing, please lower the consumer value of these uh, goods and services. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And you can look at what one of the European Union commissioners in this area uh, did at the beginning of the pandemic in March. And I mean, the fact that he had to go hat in hand to these companies and say, please limit the bandwidth that consumers get is incredible to me. And if you look at some of these message boards and you see consumers complaining about you know, they signed up for an HD service and now they're lucky if they can get an SD stream. I mean, that's the kind of thing that ultimately deserves consumers. And this is the argument I've made for many years is that this notion of heavily regulating something sounds appealing in the abstract. You know, why wouldn't we want to heavily regulate it and uh, you know, treat every single bit uh, you know, under government oversight? Well, I can result... think of a thousand reasons, but yeah, exactly. proceed. Absolutely. But this is the result is that at the end of the day, they did not incentivize sufficient infrastructure investment to be confident that when the peak traffic went up, that the Netflixes and the YouTubes of the world would be able to deliver content. It would, wouldn't overwhelm the network. And so ask the typical European consumer, are you happy with this utility style regulation that has resulted in you getting spotty streams of Tiger King or whatever it is you might want to watch? And I don't think they are happy. And well, that's why I think our market based framework is the right one. I think um, I want to extend this this conversation for just a moment from the content and the service uh, into the network itself. But before we get there, I, I believe it's not just the Netflixes of the world that we're talking about. Uh, it was this spring, you know, very personal anecdote. I understand that anecdote uh, does not make for data uh, when we do these analyses. But my own uh, my own family experience, you know, my son had. Uh, medical procedure that he needed here at Children's Medical Hospital. Moving to a telehealth system was available because of the infrastructure that had been built. The alternative was he would not have the procedure available for an unknown number of months. And we see that sort of health effect spread through our entire society. Uh, people that are getting the monitoring that they need. Um, I think that there's more on the line here than, than Tiger King. Uh, as much as one right. might love it. Yeah, with that question, I mean, we've been focused a lot, and I hope we'll have a chance to discuss this, but uh, telehealth in particular has been a focus of mine throughout my tenure, but especially over the last six months, and our execution of a COVID-19 telehealth program has been very well received in part because a lot of these healthcare providers have the infrastructure in place so that they can use tablets or you know, wireless devices of any kind to monitor patients remotely. Without that broadband connection connecting the patient and the provider, none of that would be possible. And so all these success stories we're now seeing coming in as a result of the FCC's telehealth efforts uh, over the last six months, that would not be possible without this high-speed infrastructure. So as you said, telehealth, remote learning, precision agriculture, all of these things require a broadband connection, but that requires us to have the right framework to incentivize that connection in the first place. Yep. Now, were there specific barriers uh, in the law, either lack of clarity or a regulation in place that you were able to remove in the last six months? Were there rules or regulations that were never needed? Uh, they really only came to the fore and we identified them because of the crisis? Hmm. A good question. So the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, one of the first things I did in early, early in the year, February and March, I can't remember exactly what date, but I sent a letter to Congress and said, we are in the midst of a massive shift of society to a home environment. We need certain legal authorities here in order to address the challenge. And one of the things I asked them to do was to set up, to give the FCC authority and funding for telehealth, specifically called the COVID-19 telehealth program. Congress did that in the CARES Act, passed the law on a Thursday, president signed it on a Friday. On Monday, I presented my fellow commissioners with a plan, a very detailed plan on executing on that new authority. We, in July, we finished out the $200 million in funding they gave us to 539 healthcare providers around the country. And as a result of that, 
because we were able to operate outside of the statutory framework of our rural healthcare program, which is a 20 something year old program, it was much more flexible, much more nimble, much more adaptable to the needs of the healthcare provider and patients, as opposed to the regulatory and statutory dictates that are in the law now. And so that was, from our perspective, at least very helpful. The other thing I will point out, as you mentioned, the never needed question is absolutely key. I've long said for years, for example, that we need to break down some of the barriers that stand in the way of telehealth, interstate licensing for medical professionals, for instance. And my counterpart, Administrator Sidi Mavirma at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has done a fantastic job of think, rethinking some of those regulations in terms of reimbursement and the like. I just signed a, a memorandum of understanding with Secretary Alex Azar from HHS and Secretary Sonny Perdue from USDA so we can collaborate to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to remove regulatory roadblocks. From the consumer perspective, they could care less what agency has a regulatory bite at the apple. What they want is seamless delivery of healthcare, better access, better outcomes. And so we need to work as a government to make sure that as we emerge from the pandemic, any of these legacy regulations or legal barriers are removed once and for all because we need to focus, the, the true test should be what is in the consumer welfare, not how do we pigeonhole something within the framework of a 1996 or 1972 law. No, I, I mentioned, we're, I wanna move this conversation from the services, which are where the rubber meets the road for the consumer to the kind of the invisible part of all this. Uh, the digital divide speaks to that access to the network. Uh, this is an important issue for you and the commission, but it's not a new issue. This has been around, uh, I believe Larry Irving, uh, our friend Larry, coined this term in the second Clinton administration. He's been working on it diligently since. But what is that notion of the digital divide and why is it still salient? Why do we still have this question if it's uh, nearly 25 years old since Larry brought it to the national attention? Yeah, I think the reason uh, we focus on it is because we recognize that broadband underlies so much of our daily lives. The fact that we are able to do this video chat, for example, requires a broadband connection. Telehealth requires broadband. Precision agriculture, remote learning, virtually everything we do, uh, in addition to the standard communication services of a voice call, requires some sort of broadband connection. And too many Americans, several million, are on the wrong side of that divide. And as a result, that essentially limits the ability of individuals and their families and communities to thrive. And so we focused on that from day one since I came into office. Uh, many different priorities we're addressing, but that has been the top one. And we've made a lot of strides, but we have more to do, uh, no question about it. And uh, so, yeah. I'm sure you've uh, heard reference to one of your predecessors. He, he once quipped, um, well, sure, there's a digital divide. Some people choose to live in the cities. Some people choose to live in rural areas and they cost different amounts to deliver service. I have, he said, at my home, a Mercedes divide. I really wish I drove a Mercedes, but I drive a Toyota. What, why is this a concern for a federal regulatory agency and uh, not something either handled in the private markets or something that uh, Congress would handle through its general welfare authority and not uh, specific mm -hmm. regulatory authority? I think the reason is first and foremost, because Congress has made a decision uh, in the Universal Service Fund, which it established a couple of decades ago, uh, that the SEC should have a role in targeting those areas where the market is unlikely to, or in fact has not for many years, uh, solve the problem of digital access. And so for those parts of the country where you would not find and have not found a private actor willing to spend money, uh, the high upfront capital expenditures necessary to build a network, that they believe uh, that the FCC should have a role in trying to fund uh, private companies to do that. And so that's what we've tried to do. And over the last three years, we've introduced, within that framework, we've introduced some significant market-based reforms. I mean, number one, and this might seem obvious to you and to everybody watching, but to focus on unserved areas, if there's already a private actor doing the work without subsidies, we're not gonna subsidize a second competitor to do the thing. We wanna focus on those parts of the country that don't have service. And secondly, this program used to be essentially cutting a check to a telecom company and saying, you know, buy a con Dios, we hope you do the right thing with the money. Whereas now we've instituted over the last three years, a reverse auction where different companies using a variety of technologies, so long as they meet our service thresholds and our deadlines for build out, are able to compete for that funding. And that has significantly driven down the cost of this program and extended the amount of funding we can give to close the digital divide. So uh, within that 
the statutory framework Congress has given us, which might not seem market-based at first, we've actually introduced some significant market-based innovations that have allowed us to move the ball forward. Uh, I, I want to uh, maybe wrap up this topic for now, but in order to do so, I'm going to read verbatim a question that's come in. And the reason I'm going to read it verbatim is I think you might recognize it. It comes from Jerry, and he writes, I live in a very rural area and use six megabit DSL internet connection. By the FCC's definition, I am deprived of broadband, but this connection was more than adequate for me to do my job when I worked from home two days a week as the FCC's chief economist a couple <laughs> years ago. When it comes to subsidies for broadband deployment, will the FCC ever be able to say mission accomplished? Or is this just another example of Ronald Reagan's adage that the closest thing to eternal life on earth is a federal program? Well, fantastic question from a superb economist, and I hold Jerry in the highest esteem. Uh, I, I agree that one of the things that we need to have is uh, some sort of metric for success. We just can't keep sending money out the door without any sense of what it is we're sending out the door for. And as part of the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which is another reverse auction that we've set up that will start on October 29th, we've set the bar at the federal definition of broadband, 25 megabit per second service, uh, which is sort of future proof, if you will, and with incentive uh, for companies to bid at a higher level tier. And uh, certainly we would love to see every part of this country, big cities and small towns alike, get the internet access they need. But I do think it's important to recognize when the job is done. And that's part of the reason why over the last three years, we've said, you know what, if there's a part of uh, an urban area or suburban area that already has multiple competitors, let's not focus limited taxpayer funds on overbuilding in that area. Let's focus on the rural areas that don't have any service whatsoever or have very spotty service that's not sufficient to meet their needs. So um, <clears throat> definitely here where Jerry's coming from, and I share his vision of a program that is limited in scope to accomplishing the goal, the clear goal for which it was intended. So, and, and just to, to clarify, because it, um, you know, it seems to add a divergence with what I want to talk about next, which is the Keep America Connected pledge, you know, very yeah. recent innovation. Uh, but it seems a divergence that all of these programs, the subsidy programs, the rural program that you mentioned, <coughs> to uh, the reverse auctions, they're focused on the network. And yet uh, what Larry Irving has advocated very passionately for many years, what my friend at the Brookings Institute, Nicole Turner Lee advocates about the digitally invisible, there we're talking about people that may have networks, but they don't have access because of uh, it's a matter of means, right? And right. so is it fair to say the FCC programs are focused on networks and not on people uh, because th that's easier to manage, it's easier for Congress to wrap its uh, collective head around, or, or am I misinterpreting that? Well, I think generally speaking, uh, our legal authority is limited to providing connectivity as opposed to subsidizing, for example, devices and the like, uh, or having uh, authority to set up digital literacy programs. And that's typically not what we have focused on. Um, and over the last three years, one of the things that has been important to, for me, again, is to focus, as you pointed out, on connectivity for people as opposed to the competitors that are uh, focused on delivering connectivity. So, for example, in the Lifeline program, we've done a lot of things to reform the program so that it's not essentially a subsidy to corporations that are supposed to provide service. It's a subsidy that's intended for poor individuals who can't afford the service itself. So, for example, making the program more user-friendly uh, for the consumer who wants to sign up or enabling them to get better service and higher speed services and the like. I mean, that's what we've been focused on. So at the end of the day, we want all of these programs to be focused on the consumer welfare, as an economist might say, or on the consumer interest as somebody else might, just focus on the individual as opposed to whatever company happens to inhabit the space. That's not so much our concern. It's the overall consumer welfare and the welfare of individual consumers within that geographic area that we're concerned about. And, and so um, a corollary might be, uh, we should not expect anytime soon that the Congress is going to suddenly uh, take up the argument that we also have a Mercedes divide. The, the Congress implements laws, they pass laws that say we want to subsidize this. And in that way, your job is to do it in the most efficient manner possible. Um, we, we've shifted into access. So I, I do want to talk about the Keep Connected America Connected Pledge. Uh, 
This is something um, I don't think most people are aware of. Uh, it's got widespread participation throughout the market and industry. Could you just describe what is it? Uh, what, what, is, yeah. what is that issue there? Yes, I very vividly remember uh, sitting around in my office in early March and we recognized that uh, millions, hundreds of millions of Americans were going to be shifting to home. And that meant that broadband was more important than ever. And so then the question became, well, what, if anything, should the FCC do to maintain those digital connections? And we came up with a three-part pledge that uh, companies could take. Number one, not cutting off consumers uh, from service, broadband or telephone service, because of disruptions caused by the pandemic. Number two, the companies waiving any late fees or associated charges uh, that weren't able to be paid because of the pandemic. And number three, opening up Wi-Fi hotspots to any consumer who might need them, even if they weren't subscribers. This is what we call the Keep Americans Connected pledge. And I was on a number of different phone calls with trade associations, with many, many different companies uh, in early March, talking about the pledge, urging them to step up to the plate. And they did that. Uh, almost 750 broadband and telephone providers took that initial pledge. And in addition to that, I challenged them to go above and beyond the pledge in ways that they saw fit uh, through increasing speeds to consumers at no charge, which they did, uh, many of them did. Uh, you're making sure that low-income consumers had new offerings, which many of them did. Working with schools and libraries and hospitals for bespoke services, which many of them did. Uh, that initial pledge expired in mid-May. We extended it until June, the end of June, June 30th. And over 800 almost uh, providers took that pledge, covering the vast majority of American consumers. And to me, it really speaks to the best of that public-private partnership, which I know is a somewhat a trite and overused phrase, but it goes back to our original point of markets instead of mandates. There are some who would have loved to have just commandeered the entire broadband ecosystem, made all of it essentially government command and control, and that would have been a disaster. I mean, first of all, from a timing standpoint, we never would have been able to go through the regulatory rulemaking process with dispatch. We would have been challenged in court and we probably would have lost, et cetera. But more important than that, we wouldn't have gotten the results that we've gotten over the last three months through that voluntary based system. And uh, that's why I think it, that uh, the markets over mandates idea is one that has a lot of force for, at the end of the day for consumers. And I'm really proud of the work that uh, we did and that all these companies did to step up to the plate. By and large, as I said, consumers have been very well served by these broadband networks, despite the massive increase in traffic. And that wouldn't have happened without the infrastructure that happened in years past and their willingness to step up with for their fellow American in a time of need. I, I think uh, it's just a tremendous demonstration of what uh, corporate leaders, big and small, you mentioned there's 750 participants. Uh, so these are not all um, you know, big ticker symbols that we, we think of when we, or the logos we think of when we think of telecom companies. These are companies of all shapes and sizes. Um, it really speaks to the relationship they have with the community where they operate. That's how they internalize their role, is to be uh, part of an ecosystem with their vendors, with their customers, with their employees, and not just uh, uh, profit maximizers where they're all off driving Mercedes and, and yachts on the weekend. Uh, Absolutely. I, and, and I would add to that, I mean, it's not just what we were asking of them, they were asking something of us in certain cases. So for example, we granted some, some of these smaller providers emergency access to spectrum, uh, for example, in the 5.9 gigahertz band, and that allowed companies, smaller ones that nobody has ever heard of, to really ramp up the speeds they offer to reach, uh, broaden the reach of their access the networks. And that was absolutely critical. And to me, I think it goes to one of the points that CEI has hammered on really well is which of these regulatory barriers was never necessary in the first place? What have you tweaked over the last six months that can be a model for a more market-based framework in the future? And a lot of the regulatory steps we've taken to help some of these smaller companies, I think is really going to be a guidepost for us going forward. Now, I think a generous uh, description of all this would be to say uh, quickly and with clear insight into what was needed, the FCC acted to coordinate, right? You brought people together around three central ideas and said, can you agree to this? A critical review of the same behavior, the same actions, same fact pattern from the past couple months is that, well, there's really no such thing as voluntary uh, pledges like this when you have a, a powerful independent regulator that controls the purse strings, so to speak, for your company. And so you were 
whether you mean to or not, coercing them. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you address that critique? And on the other side, the most generous description, what does it gloss over? What, it, what is part of that is not quite true? I think uh, what that view would obscure is the fact that both in word and deed, uh, we made clear that the Keep Americans Connected pledge was a voluntary effort, that we all needed to be in it together, and that ultimately this was good for companies, not just for the commission and the American public. Uh, for instance, if customers were ultimately cut off from broadband service, over time, th that would harm, harm particular companies in the marketplace if they weren't there uh, for the consumers in a moment of need. And uh, moreover, a lot of the companies want to maintain those connections to their existing customer base. As they emerge from the pandemic, they want to be able to say to the customer, look, we were there for you and we want you to stay with us now. And a lot of companies have said, uh, and many of them even after the pledge has expired, have done things like, for example, waiving all of, of the accumulated late fees and uh, continue to increase services, ramped up uh, the data offerings that they do. And this is beyond the pledge's expiration. Why would they do that? And I would argue that the market itself creates a strong incentive for companies to compete with each other, but also to maintain a good relationship with their existing customer base and the prospective customers and the ability that they have to go out in the market and say, hey, we were there for people when it really counted. That's a powerful calling card uh, if you're a broadband customer looking for a new provider. Are, are there lessons here? Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, the, the team at uh, Health and Human Services, what Virma has been doing. Are there lessons here for the regulatory community that operates in the health and medical device and vaccine space for how, um, how to organize or structure uh, what might fall under this trite category of public-private partnerships when it comes to 2021 and vaccinations or testing? That's a good Are question. Are share these lessons or what, what's missing there? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I obviously can't speak uh, beyond my scope of expertise and uh, you know, the technology aspects of healthcare are something I have a tremendous interest in. If there are particular uh, healthcare regulations or legal restrictions that uh, you know, need to be tweaked, they should, certainly should do that. But I will say from a technology perspective, maximizing the seamlessness of uh, healthcare connected care solutions, I think is absolutely vital. So from my perspective, at least, if a telehealth visit provides comparatively or even superior care, comparatively good or superior care to an in-person visit, then from my perspective, insurance, uh, we need to think about the reimbursement rates being at, at parity. Uh, and same thing in terms of the interstate medical licensures, uh, to the extent that there's something that HHS or CMS or you know, if Congress has to change the law or it has to be state by state, that'd be another thing. So I think there are a lot of things like that that we need to tweak in order to make sure that this technology, which doesn't care about state boundaries or other artificial restrictions, is able to reach its maximum potential. Okay, I want to remind our audience, uh, I just saw a little red dot pop up. That means I need to check my queue of questions. If you have questions for Chairman Pai, uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or uh, send an email directly to events at CEI.org and we'll, we'll do our best to get as many questions in from the audience as possible. Um, uh, just to wrap this up, uh, and again, to link back to something we have been talking about, um, the success of the Keep America Connected pledge, d does that, uh, do you think there's a lesson there? Is there a case study to take to Congress for why uh, perhaps the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund or other aspects of the way we do universal service need to be rethought and uh, shrunk to be ramped down because we've seen market reaction and provide the good that uh, these subsidies are designed to, you know, deal with a market failure. Yeah, I certainly think that there are many lessons that one could draw from the pledge, which is, as I mentioned, a voluntary market-based effort or through our universal service fund reforms, which are more market-based. And I think the common lesson is, and I'm not sure how exactly it would play on legislation, but the, the common lesson is that over time, markets as opposed to preemptive regulation deliver much more value for consumers. It is very seductive to say that the government should oversee every single aspect of the communications sector, micromanage how networks operate, how they're built, uh, how they deliver services and the like. But over time, that disincentivizes investment, reduces innovation, 
And ultimately, none of that is good for consumers. And so I would hope that our Congress, as it looks to reform the Communications Act, if it does so, would try to keep that in mind. The other thing I will point out, and this is not necessarily uh, specific to the pandemic, but it's something I've been thinking about for a while, is to the extent that we are talking about internet protocol-based technologies, IP-based technologies, that is inherently an interstate service. It, and to me, it, we've reached the point where it doesn't make any sense to have multiple different layers of regulatory review if you're building a wireless network or providing an IP-enabled service. You're jumping through federal hoops and state hoops and municipal hoops, and in some cases, even uh, the, any one of the 574 federally recognized tribes uh, might have a bite at the regulatory apple. We need a consistent market-based level of regulation. And increasingly what we're seeing is dissimilar asymmetric regulations popping up at various levels of government. And you know, I think we might have been able to tolerate that before the digital age. Yeah, companies found a way to navigate that regulatory thicket. But now, especially when we're in a global competition for talent and capital uh, and you know, the rights to innovation that come from that, I think we really need to have a fundamental rethink of some of those IP-based technology policies. Uh, it's, uh, many commentators have observed over the last uh, easily 15 years, but uh, pr probably going back at least 20, um, both through the regulatory apparatus and through uh, the courts, we've seen a gradual but consistent shift of authority uh, on these telecom issues to the federal government from the states. Uh, do, do you foresee or are you aware, is there a state out there that's ready to take the leap and uh, clearly circumscribe the state utility commission and say, we understand that you're gonna keep with electricity and regulate water rates and quality of service for these things, but we really wanna limit your ability to get into telecom because that's being handled through general consumer protection anti-fraud law with the attorney general. And it's being ha handled at the federal government because of the digital nature of these technologies. Is there a state on the horizon where we can help them uh, radically reduce their regulatory footprint? I think, to my knowledge, there are some states that have limited the state regulatory jurisdiction to intrastate services as opposed to the interstate services uh, in certain cases. And in addition to that, a number of states, I think it's 28 now, or maybe 29, have passed a small cell bills, 5G bills that essentially streamline the process of 5G deployment in recognition, I would argue, of the fact that companies need to build these 5G networks at scale and they can't you know, if there are many different municipalities they have to go to for various permissions and it's just ad hoc, they're not going to be able to do that. So I think there are some states that have their eye on the prize, which is, again, consumer welfare writ large, as opposed to the parochial uh, regulatory interests of any particular municipality on any given issue. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm always happy to work with any state or local government that's looking to you know, promote more broadband deployment in a pro-consumer way. So you, you've mentioned uh, 5G here, and just earlier we were talking about uh, some important developments on spectrum, for, particularly for the small providers. What, it, what has been your spectrum track record? Uh, there's been tons of activity in the last nine months, and uh, I don't want to try to encapsulate it all. Why don't you tell us what matters coming out of the FCC on spectrum right now? The bottom line is we have been the most aggressive and effective FCC in history in terms of freeing up spectrum for the commercial marketplace. We've held the 24 and 28 gigahertz auctions in 2018 and 2019. We recently held the upper 37, 39, 47 gigahertz auction. Those auctions alone freed up almost five gigahertz of spectrum, which by comparison was more spectrum than was held by mobile broadband providers, terrestrial mobile broadband providers combined when I came into office. We haven't even stopped there. We just finished a very successful auction of the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum, commonly called CVRS, raised $4.5 billion for the US Treasury at something like 227 bidders. We're uh, still going. We have a C-band auction coming up on December 8th. It's going to be the major auction of mid-band spectrum, 280 megahertz from 3.7 to 3.98. We've teed up auctions. Uh, we're targeting the first half of the year for the 2.5 gigahertz auction. We have outstanding proceedings on other spectrum bands. And that's just on the license side. In terms of other spectrum, we've made the biggest move in FCC history for unlicensed innovation. Freed up 1,200 megahertz in the six gigahertz band, a 5X increase in the amount of spectrum available for Wi-Fi. And, and just help, help us yeah. understand, how, do, how does somebody use, how does a provider use that piece of spectrum? 
Oh, so many different ways. So There's so much example, available now that was not available at this high end. Definitely. So if you're a consumer at home and you're frustrated by the fact that you've got a couple of kids on Wi-Fi, maybe your spouse is on Wi-Fi as well as you, and things don't seem to work, you might be on a congested Wi-Fi channel. Well, we've exploded the supply of in-home Wi-Fi at a certain power level, and the routers are now coming out. In fact, I just saw on Twitter this morning, a new router has come out to take advantage of this to provide much higher speed connectivity and to target that bandwidth to particular devices in a much smarter way. That's just the consumer in-home experience. Outdoors, fixed wireless providers in rural areas can use these super wide channels, 160 or even 320 megahertz wide channels to provide up to gigabit Wi-Fi, depending of course on the distance and the terrain, et cetera. So we are just on the brink of some exciting innovation for consumers using the six gigahertz band. And I'm telling you, we're gonna look back on the 2.4 and five gigahertz era of Wi-Fi as something in the distant past once six gigahertz really takes over. Wi-Fi 6E as it's known is going to turbocharge unlicensed innovation and benefits for consumers in ways that we can't even think of right now. I, um, for all the people out there who could not track the two dot this and the megahertz that, <laughs> yeah, I just want to point out the sheer enthusiasm that you are exuding as you talk about the tremendous consumer gains that have that have been flowing from this. Um, uh, fear not, audience, if you don't understand what Spectrum is about and what these technical terms are, uh, there's some very good things coming out of the commission. Uh, I, I do want to ask, you, though. Not to interrupt, Ken, but you can go to FCC.gov slash 5G, and that gives us a, a much more detailed, much more plain English description of all the stuff we're doing. But it lacks, it lacks the passion. It lacks the passion. But there's no, a for yeah, I grew up in an era of wired telephones in the in the wall, and you know, it's incredible to me to think about the, the fact that we're able to do something like this call. I mean, wireless innovation has been tremendous over the last 20 years. I can't wait to see where we go in the next 20 years. Now that the FCC has put some of the critical building blocks in place, it's going to be really exciting. Well, I want to ask about. Um... Uh, uh, first of all, I, I apologize for the eye roll. You mentioned how much money went to the federal treasury. Uh, like <laughs> you, I think the primary good of these auctions is that they take an asset, an asset that cannot be warehoused. It's either use it or lose it in the moment. And they put it out for productive use. So something that was previously not being used, made available to consumers, is now being put out to use in the SEC's actions have just exploded the availability of this asset. So that's that's wonderful. Uh, the, the money that flows to the treasury is an interesting byproduct from, from my point of view. But- um, yeah. No, I hear you. There, there is a licensing regime in place and this dates to the 1920s, uh, the Radio Act in 1927, I believe. The idea is that the FCC looks at the equipment that would connect to the spectrum, the use of the spectrum. Uh, are we ready to take steps forward on a path, the path that we've maybe stuttered with, but we've started toward genuine property rights? And how, how would you foresee not just getting more spectrum out available, but moving the legal apparatus forward uh, as we go ahead with um, your spectrum agenda? That's a, that's a really good question. I mean, obviously Congress would have to change the law for that general framework to be changed. And I'm not sure what uh, their appetite for uh, doing so is right now or what direction they might take those reforms. They, if they, they might just to. need a passionate leader to bring them the idea. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, oh, so there you within, are, there you, there you are. Well, I will say within the constraints of the current law, I mean, we've done a lot of innovative work on trying to think about different ways to maximize the use of this resource. And so one of them obviously is the tried and true spectrum auctions that of course were the uh, idea of Ronald Coase back in that famous 1959 paper, uh, appropriately called the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, but part of it is even to the extent that we have incumbents like federal agencies in some of these bands, we try to work very creatively on sharing protocols. With technological innovation, uh, the fact that one person is using it doesn't necessarily mean that nobody else can ever use it in any part of the country at any given time. So we've tried to work very creatively on sharing protocols that allow everybody to, the, the over, um, how should I put it? The overall uh, use of the resources maximized as opposed to one particular entity, like a federal agency, having exclusive use of it, which might maximize the use of it for that entity, but actually deserves the broader consumer interest. And so 
Uh, that's one of the things that we've been trying to do. And uh, we've recently done in 3.5 gigahertz band where we have a different tiers. We, we've auctioned off uh, pr pr uh, priority access licenses for a certain 3.5 gigahertz spectrum. There's uh, military radar in there as well that gets priority. And so that kind of sharing framework is one that we've tried to be creative on, but ultimately it will take Congress to change the law for us to do something more fundamental. Okay. Uh, I have another question in from the audience. This is from Pat. He's very interested in what's been happening with the uh, another set of explosions, uh, but the explosion of space launches. Yeah. Uh, where has the FCC been involved and what role do you play as chairman to, to facilitate space exploration? And, and I don't, I'm interested whether you go with uh, private launches or you start talking about LEO satellites. Uh, what, what's going on in space that the audience ought to know about? There's so much going on, and thanks, Pat, for the question. I'm so excited about space. I mean, even as a kid, I'll confess, I, I always sense, found something fascinating about space. And now, to be in this perch, we actually do have a role in space. There's a new space age going on, and part of that involves communications technologies. Uh, so for the, over the last three years, we're the first FCC in history to authorize non-geostationary orbit constellations, these low Earth orbit satellites. Companies like SpaceX and OneWeb and LeoSat and Kepler and Kuiper uh, are authorized to provide a satellite service lower in the Earth's orbit. Uh, and so there's a lot of great stuff happening there. We've also streamlined the process for small sats. These are small, small satellites that uh, might be able to be deployed to create a mesh network, if you will, in space and provide low bandwidth services, like, for example, Internet of Things services to uh, shipping companies and the like. I streamlined the process for that, to recognizing that they're not huge satellites. The other thing we've also done, and I know this might seem more regulatory at first, is to update our orbital debris regulations. With thousands of satellites going up into space, that creates a lot more possibility uh, for orbital debris. And of course, in space, any orbital debris, as we know from the movie Gravity, could have long lasting effects. And so for the first time since 2004, we've taken a fresh look at how to update those uh, debris orbital debris regulations to ensure that in, the, in a way that still preserves the innovative instinct, uh, we're able to create a space, uh, safe space environment. So a lot of exciting stuff happening in space. And in terms of private launches, I mean, my God, it's uh, incredible to see the reusable rocket innovation that's happened. The fact that companies are now deploying these rockets at uh, satellites on these rockets at scale. I mean, it's just so exciting to see. And the fact that it's American based, we're no longer reliant on having to go to Russia, for example, to do these space launches. And we're not ceding space to other countries. We're actually taking a leadership role, which is just great to see for uh, those of us who believe in American based innovation. Uh, I, I wanted to um, clarify something and then maybe draw on your University of Chicago Law and Econ training. Uh, but as you talk about the question of debris, space debris, um, you use a very, very common word these days, talk about safety, right? Mm, and yeah. as we all think about health risks and travel and safety and risk and risk assessment have come to the fore in very personal ways for people that they're not used to thinking about. Uh, my understanding is the program that the legal structure that you are pursuing and have been putting forward is really one drawing on the lessons from Chicago, drawing on uh, this Kosian notion about externalities and, and internalizing damage that might flow to others, either immediately adjacent or into the future. That economic reasoning, uh, is it persuasive across the commission? I, I think it's persuasive to you. I've heard you talk about it many times, but do you find that that's a common set of views or do we have a lot more work to do there at the FCC? I do think we have more work to do. Uh, certainly some of my colleagues have embraced this model of thinking, uh, incorporating more economic analysis into our work. And one of the innovations I'm proud to say we pioneered was the creation of an Office of Economics and Analytics. Uh, one of the things I never understood back when I was a staffer at the FCC or when I was a commissioner was the fact that we have an Office of General Counsel that puts lawyers at the table we have an office of engineering technology that puts engineers at the table. But when it comes to the basic framework of economic analysis, there was no econ economists were scattered throughout the agency. And one of the things that we did was to set up this OEA, as it's called, so that when we're thinking about a proposal or an order, it has to go through that economic analysis at the front end, as opposed to economic analysis being done in a slapdash way at the 11th hour, where the economists feel pressured to simply ratify whatever it is the FCC wants to do. And so the incorporation of cost benefit analysis, the consideration of externalities, of the use of uh, auction 
based frameworks in things like Universal Service Fund, OEA has been absolutely critical in the FCC's operations. And I hope going forward that all commissioners will embrace that. They'll see things like CBA as a friend as opposed to an enemy or a, you know, a, a thing to, to tout as opposed to a thing to be concerned about. Uh, because ultimately that's the true test, right? If you went to the average American citizen and say, hey, we just passed a bunch of regulations, the cost might outweigh the benefits, but yeah, it'll be fine anyway. They'd look at you as if you're from Mars, but somehow in this environment, people see things like cost benefit analysis as sometimes having a pejorative connotation that I don't think it should have. I'm going to try to combine a couple questions from our audience. Uh, they, they want to get at this question of legacy a little bit. Um, one is about there's an open seat. Commissioner Riley's term has come to an end. It does not look like he's going to be uh, renominated. Uh, and uh, the prospect of your ideological or intellectual opponents. You know, what is the worst that people are saying about what you've been doing? And <laughs> how do you think that will land uh, in 2021 if President Biden is the next president of the United States? Well, I know those are many hot topics in there, uh, all of which I'm sure you will not be surprised that I will dodge. Uh, but what I will say is this, that uh, over the last three years, a lot of the market-based reforms, a lot of the innovations that we've pioneered have been severely, and I would argue hyperbolically criticized. At the end of the internet as we know it, we're going to end weather forecasting. We're going to destroy GPS. This is uh, accentuating the digital. I mean, all of these different things have not come to pass. And to me, it's important that whoever sits in this seat always focuses on doing the right thing, even when, especially when it's hard. I've had to make a lot of hard decisions. The commission has had to make a lot of hard decisions. And I'm really proud of the fact that we've consistently done the right thing. And all of us, I mean, have, I think, really uh, taken our statutory mandate to heart and have tried to do these, you know, make these tough decisions. And so when it comes to 5G or digital divide at the end of the day, we have the ability to say, this was successful, that was successful, because we have had the courage to stay the course. And I'm gonna keep doing that uh, so long as I'm at the commission. Uh, I think you, you might anticipate my next question. It's a favorite of mine uh, because it's been a, a bugaboo of mine for 25 years. Um, what, can you give me, give our audience, what is a clear definition of the public entrance convenience and necessity? It seems to me every time I look at when this comes up and it's applied by either the FCC or another agency, it really is whatever you can get three votes for. It's just a gaping hole in the law to allow political persuasion and not genuine analysis. So what is the public interest? That's the enduring question. And to me, it almost calls to mind, I think it was Justice William Brennan who once said, uh, when asked that you know, w w the law is whatever five Supreme Court justices say it is. And I remember being struck by that when I read it years ago. And this, the same thing when it comes to the public interest, that because that term is quite vague, it is also quite elastic. And so any three member majority or greater can define the public interest. And that's why I've tried to infuse more content to that public interest standard to make sure, for example, that the public interest is defined as a regulatory framework that in which the benefits exceed the cost, which I think is pretty elementary, uh, one that comports with the law, whatever the law says and not beyond. We can't stretch the law to suit our own private uh, political preferences. Uh, different things like that we've tried to introduce to make sure that the public interest is not viewed by the and, American people, something the FCC is just making up by putting its finger in the wind. Okay, so let me, let me press you a little bit on that. Uh, are those things enduring? I mean, can the next chairman undo them? Or are you ready to advocate with me to Congress that the next iteration of communications law in this country ought not include that provision? Are you ready to strike it out of the, of the law books? Well, I can't say that I'm ready to make news today, but what I will say is that I would hope that any, any commissioner who has the privilege of serving the FCC would recognize pretty clearly that we are at our best when we respect the four corners of the statute, when we respect basic principles of economics, when we promote values that indeed endure, like innovation and competition, as opposed to preemptive regulation and you know, picking winners and losers, and regulating one's rivals and the like. I mean, I think, the, to me at least, a commissioner who believes in public choice theory and its potential dangers when applied in the communication sector is one who will interpret the public interest in an appropriate way. And, you know, but you're, you're a more optimistic man than me, and I'm pretty optimistic. <laughs> uh, but 
uh, well, let me, let me stick with this, but I'll, I'll change the terms of the question. Um, I mentioned in the introduction, you've, you've had a, a sterling career. Uh, you've represented this nation abroad. You've served as chairman of a, a major regulatory agency. You've worked in all three branches of the federal government. Um, prestigious clerkship being part of that. What branch do we find the FCC in? I remember learning that the United States federal government has three branches of interrelated overlapping authorities, three branches of government. Where's the FCC? Where do you sit? Yeah, so uh, I will, <laughs> the second you asked that question, I thought about a very, very good friend of mine uh, who I've known for many, many years, who was the first person to get in touch with me after I was confirmed as a commissioner back in 2012. And he said, congratulations, you're my first friend who is a member of an unconstitutional administrative agency. And because in his view, it didn't clearly fit within the executive, legislative, and judicial branch framework that everybody has learned since time immemorial as being the three branches of our government. And so uh, the independent agencies, especially independent ones, clearly do inhabit a different role compared to the executive branch agencies. And that's something that Congress and the courts are always struggling with. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's good. I'll note you have not yet answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I've, I've, I've often said that I would love to see some law students teasing out what the constitutional implications would be and what the policy implications would be if the FCC uh, had a different framework as uh, some other countries do. Uh, but if right now, it's much more of an academic one. I, you know, it's, I have to inhabit the role as it's been set up by Congress and blessed by the courts. And so, you know, I can't really uh, give an opinion about what my friend said back then or, you know, what some of the academics might think now. Okay, uh, I, we're, we're wrapping up. Uh, we're coming to the near the end of the time that you promised us. I know you're a very busy guy. Uh, I see that you're sitting in front of uh, a bookshelf. What are you reading these days? Yeah, so uh, right now I'm actually reading Theodore Rex, the second no uh, volume of uh, Edmund Morris's book on uh, Teddy. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, but it's one of the most inspiring books I've ever read. It's, it's incredible, like at the end of that book, you just want to get up when he's being sworn in and like yeah, USA, USA. So the second volume uh, has been pretty good so far. And I just love books like that about larger than life figures. Um, recently fi finished a book called 1492, which, uh, sorry, 1491, which uh, covers what the Americas were like before uh, Columbus's arrival. It's been a very fascinating book as well. And uh, so there's always too much to read and not enough time, especially now that I've got young kids and my you know, reading habits tend to be more Amelia Bedelia and Winnie the Pooh as opposed to the stuff that I would have read pre-kids. Very good. Uh, speaking of spare time, um, anyone who follows your social media accounts, you're very prolific <laughs> on Twitter, they know that you've recently, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna use that term elastically, the last many months, uh, you've gotten more engaged with your bicycle. Uh, yeah. what, do, what do you ride? And, and I want to follow this up and also learn if you've been watching the Tour de France and uh, who you're rooting for. <laughs> so unfortunately on the Tour de France course, I haven't been watching it. So I can't oh. really, I know, I'm so sorry. I just I haven't, uh, yeah, I haven't followed it that closely. But in terms of what I'm riding, I've got an old beat up Trek mountain bike that I've been riding for a while. It's been great because the path I take to work or when I was biking to work anyway, a part of it was along the CNO Canal, which is just an awesome ride. But part of it is also gravelly and dirty. So great for that. I've been in the market for a road bike for a while. The problem is the pandemic has just killed the supply out here in Virginia where I live. And so I haven't been able to find something. So if anyone has a good recommendation on a particular road bike and a place to get it, I would love it because to me, there's nothing better than getting out there, having you know, a little bit of uh, peace and uh, seeing a different part of the city than I would see if I were on foot or in a car. Very good. Uh, the, the appropriate answer to the question of how many bikes you own is uh, N plus one. Uh, <laughs> uh, what bike you ride is totally perfect, perfectly uh, personal preference. Um, I really want to thank you for spending the time with us, for uh, working with our team over the last many years. Uh, you're very generous with your, your time and insight. If this were in person, this is the point where I would ask for a large round of applause. Uh, since we are not, I'll just let you know that somewhere out there, people are smiling and happy to have heard your view of what's happening at the commission and where we're going forward, that deregulatory vision. I do want to remind everyone of uh, something that I am reading, and that is because on September 16th, I'll be joined for another one of these sessions with presidential historian Tevi Troy, and I have his oh. book, White House, 
Uh, so we'll be talking to Tevi in just a couple weeks about rivalries at the White House uh, at the staff level from Truman all the way through Trump. Um, next week, just to tease this out, uh, Ajit, I know you'll want to pay attention. We'll be making a special announcement here at CEI about the winner of the 2020 Julian L. Simon Memorial Award mm -hmm. and a forum uh, to follow something that we typically do during our annual dinner. And um, I'm really excited about making the announcement next week and hope you'll all be able to join us as we roll that out. Until we meet again, I wanna say thank you. Thank you, Chairman Pai, for all the work that you're doing. And uh, please look for this forum as well as all of the Competitive Enterprise Institute's work online at cei.org.